Welcome to this lunchtime lecture. Uh, we have Mark Burnett, uh, Principal Geologist at AMC Consultants, speaking from Maidenhead in the UK. And he's going to talk about the importance of, of uh, mentoring in the, in the leadership path. Uh, Mark, Mark has more than 25 years of experience in the mining industry and has had extensive exposure to the mining value, the whole mining value chain, including from right from early stage exploration to shaft sinking and operational mines. Um, Mark has spoken to us before and we appreciate him coming to the party and, and giving this presentation. I won't say much more about him at this stage, but uh, you can see his uh, email address on the front uh, on the slide in front of you. And with that, Mark, please take over and tell us about mentoring. Thanks, Craig. Thanks, everybody. I see lots of familiar faces, so I don't think I need to belabor the point of who I am, except for the fact I'm sitting in the UK at the moment, broadcasting from my maiden head offices. So the whole the whole point of this is well, why mentoring? Um, I guess it's something which for young geologists and young professionals is something which is quite critical. And for people which have been around for a little bit longer than me, it's a philosophical thing. Why should I necessarily want to share my knowledge and expertise with someone coming up the system? Now, probably the most important thing for this or potentially how to review the situation is to try and bring every professional person that's practicing in the industry up to a certain level of competence. Now we all know, even though it's not necessarily something which jumps out as a young at a young professional when they're in university and when they first start working, is at some stage in your career, you will have to take over responsibility for signing off resources and or reserves depending on the company that you're working in. And as such, what is the easiest way of transmitting all that knowledge, which you know, some people have gained over 30 years, 35 years, 25 years, to allow those numbers and those documents that we go out into the public domain to be done in such a manner that investors will be happy with it. But on an even more profound level is how do I want to know or how do I know that the person that I'm employing is going to be able to do the job correctly, is not going to make financially significant mistakes when they are interpreting data. So part of this, and there's many definitions of competence out there. Uh, this is one obviously pulled from Wikipedia. So all students, please ignore the fact that I'm referencing Wikipedia. If you do this, you will get shot down by your lecturers because it's not peer reviewed journal. The alternative way of looking at it is competence. And this is to severely uh, misquote United States Supreme Court Justice Potter Stewart is you know it when you see it. So a lot of the concept of competency is a perception based thing, but at the same time, there must be some sort of grounding in ability, technical ability and soft skills, numeric, numer numeric literacy to get you to that point where you can take over a role and do it correctly and fundamentally. Now, one of the problems that comes in with it is knowledge is not always transferable and understanding that knowledge in the context can be quite critical. Um, so this is a slide which I'm sure is familiar to a lot of you where the young geologist in training is answering a question. The information that has been imparted is correct, but the context that the information has been delivered in is totally incorrect. So where the answer may be relevant in a, in a different context, in this specific context, it is totally wrong. But the person writing it has done the best. They are communicating the information that they know, but in a situation, again, where it's totally inappropriate to be using that information to try and make a decision on that. Um, which gets us into the, this whole concept of competence and psychologists have studied this for a long time and it ties into things that most people when you know, you do your MBA courses or leadership courses, you hear about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And we get into this concept or this quaternary diagram where you move as you develop through a series of steps. So from a point where you actually don't understand that you don't know what you don't know, um, junior person starting off, where literally you actually have no idea what's expected of you. You're cut, clutching your nice shiny piece of paper from university. Uh, you've been told by your university lecturers that you graduated from the best university in the world and therefore you know everything. You gradually realize, or you quickly realize, depending on what your chief geologist would tell you, is how little you actually do know 
in terms of knowledge, whether this is purely theoretical knowledge or whether it's a practical application of that knowledge. Um, and when you start in dealing in a production environment, the mining people will very quickly let you know how little you do know. But over time, you develop those skills and you can start applying the information that you know in a very practical and real way, solving problems and giving practical solutions. Until you get to the stage where you can actually do things without even thinking about it. And that's probably one of the, the things that may affect the older people who become mentors is you've done it for so long, you don't even think about why you're doing it. It is now totally ingrained with your personality, totally ingrained with the processes that you do. It is just done automatically and by rote. And this is one of the challenges that, will, that comes in when someone is mentoring is how do you remember and understand and explain the 25 or 26 years of experience that you've got to someone that just doesn't have that background or your life experiences in a way that they're going to be able to take it on board and be able to implement it successfully. Now, in the mining environment, well, Rod, it's all very well to start talking about this in a purely theoretical and philosophical environment. But how do we apply this in a mining environment? Well, Jackie Coombs, who I'm sure is known to a number of people, uh, completed her PhD thesis, uh, I think it was 10 years ago now, offhand, where she's tried to tackle this question in terms of the then Jork 2004 code. And now if you look down at the bottom of these slides, you will see this HTML links. Um, that's the reason I actually gave my email address out. So if anybody wants the presentations, drop me an email, I'll send it to you. It's much easier uh, you know, to get the HTML links and trying to write it down from a video presentation. Anyway, so Jackie went and started to try and understand the perception of competency in the Jork environment or the Australasian mining environment. And after doing all the studies and interviews and stuff, she came out with what she called a 15-2 criteria, where for a geologist or a specifically a resource geologist to achieve a level of competency, the resource geologist would have had to have done 15 different resource estimations on two different commodities and undertaken five complete reconciliations. If this has all been done and at the same time, the, the professional, young professional has been supported by their peers, both in a formal and informal way, then they should get to the stage where they can show competency. If they haven't had that type of experience, the chances are that they're not going to be a well-rounded and highly competent individual. Now, Jackie explains this a lot better than I do. So if you look at the bottom YouTube link, uh, there's a 30 minute presentation that Jackie gives describing this uh, research in detail. Or as I said, if you go to the top HTML link, you can download the thesis where it goes through a lot of this in detail with the uh, philosophical rationale behind what she's done. So, but where did it all start? Well, mentoring in and of itself is actually a very old concept. Um, it's not something new. It's not something which is just the latest flavor of the month as we're in the 21st century and we're trying to adapt to the fourth industrial revolution and everything's changing fast and we need to try and communicate the information. It goes right back to Greek mythology. Um, and when I presented this talk to Wims in South Africa, uh, the young lady professional sort of was quite humorous that actually the very first mentor wasn't a man. The very first mentor was the goddess Athena, who is helping young Telemachus on his journey through life and to try and upskill him in terms of what he should be doing and how to react to things. And as you can see, the first time it actually enters sort of mainstream Western European literature is in 1699. So again, the concept of mentoring has got a quite a long history but it's also been used in a number of different ways. And when you start researching mentoring, you're going to come across a whole load of different terms and approaches, um, sometimes used interchangeably and sometimes used in very specific contexts. And it's understanding those contexts and what the implications are is worthwhile understanding, both from a mentee point of view or from a mentor point of view, because um, each of them will have a certain dynamic between the two individuals as you go forward. So, <clears throat> Probably the most interesting one or how most people start off by looking at mentoring is a role model, something you want to emulate. So at the moment, probably the person that a lot of people would like to emulate would be Elon Musk, you know, getting America back into space, doing it in a cost effective manner. Um, and probably the fact that he's a multi-billionaire. 
the mentor relationship, um, informal and formal. And in terms of mentoring, it also has a lot of cultural overtones. Now, that is both in the sense of country type of culture. So in the UK, mentoring is seen as a very different manner to what mentoring is seen in the United States or even within organizations. So within a military type of organization, there's a very rigid definition of what mentoring is, as opposed to say an academic environment where mentoring is a lot more fluid um, and doesn't necessarily have very rigid outcomes. And then we start moving into the more formalistic approaches, which can at times get confused with mentoring or the mentor will need to take up these roles at different stages in that relationship. Um, so the training environment where you're imparting information, the, the, the tabula rasa state where you assume that the person doesn't know anything um, and you're trying to impart that information onto a void or in the coaching environment where the person has information and you're trying to build and develop and hone those skills. So they're getting to the levels that you'd actually want them to get to so they can deliver the desired outcomes of the organization or society. That's all well and good, but as, as a young professional or someone just entering the business, why would you actually want to start looking at getting a mentor? Now there's a whole whack of reasons and, and, and here's some of them. Um, part of it is, you know, just bouncing general comments and questions off. Is this a good decision to make? How do I communicate this information to my boss? I'm in a problem at work. How do I deal with that problem? Um, I want to move into Vitz Gold Mining. Is Vitz Gold Mining as a career something I actually want to do in the short term, medium term or long term? Uh, someone that can look at you and say, look, you know, these are technical areas that you need to improve or these are the soft skill areas that you need to improve on or, you know, this behavior is not appropriate. Um, I once mentioned or mentored a, a young professional. Um, he was saying that his boss had a, a bit of a, a strange attitude to him. And in the general discussion, it turned out he was still wearing his university T-shirt to work, even though he was now in a relatively... Um, senior environment within the company he was working on. But his dress, his dress sense was inappropriate for the environment, but his boss wasn't actually telling him that was an inappropriate manner to convey the image that he should be conveying. Um, again, stimulation, a lot of day-to-day -day jobs become rote, you become stale, how do you develop? Someone giving you that dream that you can now focus on again. Um, networking is helping someone you know going to a, a drinks event but you stand in the corner because you actually just don't know who to go and talk to so someone that's going to be prepared to share that and probably the most important thing and this is going to be something i'm going to touch on later on is mentorship is free it should be a willing relationship between both parties uh, a lot of companies are setting themselves up in a, a per paid environment so company x will mentor your staff for a certain fee uh, that probably isn't going to be a true mentorship because then there's going to be, even if it's a subtle undercurrent, they're not going to necessarily give the information or advice that they need to give to someone because there's a financial transaction involved. But from the mentee's point of view, um, I'm just in that point, if you look at some of the, or read some of the older textbooks and tr uh, mentorship, the word, um, the word mentee is actually not used. Uh, it's, a, it's considered, or the previous verbiage that was used in mentorship textbooks is considered as being elitist. Um, so the preferred terminology now would be to use mentee rather than protege, which is the old terminology. But from a mentee's point of view, these are some of the things that you should be looking for. Um, you know, do they have the same values as you? Can you talk to them and communicate? I mean, there's all very well talking, but are they listening to you? Are they interested in helping you out? Um, and again, this actually cuts both ways. I've mentored people who actually don't come to the party, so I've wasted a huge amount of time and effort. What's expectations from both sides? And so if you think about this, this is almost, this is a relationship type of environments, the same type of thing that you would have with your partner or your wife. So there's give and take, you need to have similar personalities, um, you need to share and you need to both be open in terms of imparting the wisdom. But what type of person would you 
choose or select. Now there's a whole load of different role models or personality types. So, you know, do you go for the icy princess who's broken uh, the glass ceiling? Uh, the rather louche cowboy who knows everybody. He's a bit dodgy, but he can get the job done. The really wise old guy who must be at the top of his game because really no one understands what he's trying to say. Um, the older guy who's also cryptic, but you know he's suave and debonair and can introduce you to all the right people. He doesn't say much, but he'll always have your back. Or you can be totally power hungry and want to get to the top regardless of who you step on. Or you may want to go for maybe a softer, fuzzier alternative. Um, though I wouldn't necessarily say that would be the best choice for a career success. But also the mentor chooses you. So as I said, it, it's a two-way street. So you may approach me to want to be a, want me to mentor you or approach somebody else, but the mentor does not have to mentor you. It, as I said, it's got to be a two-way two-way street. And with all mentorship, part of the quid pro quo is that if I'm helping you, I, I do have an expectation that you as the mentee will impart that knowledge to the next generation when it's appropriate. So the whole relationship of paying it forward. And as I said earlier, and this is just to expand on it, um, unfortunately, this slide is a little bit blurry, which is, again, one of the reasons why I put all the HTML links on it, is that at different stages in your career, or in different companies, there's different expectations in terms of the type of relationship that is going to happen. So if we were to look at quadrant D, the highly structured long-term relationship, uh, some people will argue this is actually not a true mentorship relationship. Um, this is the type of relationship that large companies enter into for succession planning, where someone gets identified very early in their career, and they're taken through a set of development programs, training programs, center and executive leadership programs, and everything else. So there's actually very little um, organic development. It's all very much planned from the start with an end goal in mind. Or the opposite extreme down in quadrant A, informal, um, as needed. So if you, you know, like a good friend, you pick the phone up and you ask a problem and then you don't necessarily have too much contact um, over time. Okay, so you don't necessarily have to have the ongoing relationship um, developing, but generally uh, the informal short term does actually make sense. If it's someone that's more experienced than you that you can pick up the phone and drop them an email and just say, got the problem, how do we deal with it? A question that's been asked several times and I've been given this presentation or similar ones is, you know, do I choose more than one person? Now, I think the point earlier with the Star Wars character should partially answer that. You should. One person is not going to be able to give you all the answers. You may have a primary mentor, but there are the people that you may drag in at various stages in your career. So you may have a mentor that will teach you or mentor you in data mine or geostatistics or quality assurance and quality control or um, emotional intelligence and social intelligence. So each person has their strengths. And this is just a very simple way to understand the difference of coaching versus mentoring. And this is probably an extreme example, but military is very much about getting to the point in the shortest possible time. It doesn't necessarily matter what the mentee's expectations are or skills. The mentor is getting them, or in this case, a coach is, or instructor is getting them to the point that they can perform functionally sorry, perform and function in that in specific environment. The mentoring environment is more like this, a helping hand to get you to overcome obstacles which are in your path. And this is just a summary slide. Um, so there's a, some nice bullet points so you can actually start seeing and comparing and contrasting. Now, again, the reason that this slide is in is numerous mentees of in the past said, well, am I in a coaching environment or am I in a mentoring environment? They're not too sure. Uh, so this is the type of thing which will say, okay, actually you're in a coaching environment. This is not a mentorship environment. You're probably just as well going and still hunting for someone that you can see as a mentor. Um, probably the most critical aspect of this is the rapport issue. So coaching, in, in at least in this definition of coaching is there's no relationship building. You're given a task, you're instructed on how to do the task and you deliver the task. Where mentoring is an ongoing relationship building uh, environment. 
this has probably been an important thing for um, a lot of young professionals. It's not something which I have found really discussed uh, in most mentoring talks I've been to um, or most books. But the so-called corporate hyena phenomenon is actually quite well, uh, quite well known. Uh, they're not normally discussed in mentoring books per se. Uh, there's a really good book which is worthwhile acquiring and reading called Snakes and Suits When Psychopaths Go to Work. Um, I don't have the reference in here, unfortunately, but worthwhile reading. But the point of this, and this is more for, again, the young professional that moves into a large company, is that the first friendly face you see is not always going to be the best person to share your trust with or open up immediately. There is also a certain degree of caution to exercise until you've sussed out who you can go and trust because you may unfortunately end up in the situation where you have trusted the wrong person and it doesn't go particularly well for you. So I just think just in case list, um, when you're looking for a mentor, so this is the mentee environment, um, someone you respect, do they have the achievements, do they have the things that you want to learn? Um, do they enjoy challenges? Are they prepared to listen and share that information from with you? Will they actually follow through? There's a lot of people that will say they're going to become mentors, but you can just never get hold of them. Uh, though on that point, I must say, I've also had lots of experiences where mentees will approach a mentor and then expect to be just spoon fed. It is a two way street and environment. Um, can you be yourself with them? Do you, and this is where I do have some issues with the so-called structured corporate mentoring thing. It's very difficult in that environment if you are supposedly a mentor to have that open trust relationship because you don't know, or rather there's, a, you, there's never this uh, open discussion environment because there's always underlying political overtones in terms of, do I tell this person that information? Will it je potentially jeopardize my career? Can I trust them not to put on the management hat and go to the, the training manager or HR and say there is an issue here? Um, not a controller and as someone that's going to allow you to develop the way that you need to develop as well. And this is the very last point is again, something I've been asked to put in um, a warning, don't go here. Um, it normally ends in tears for both parties. So where do you go and find them? Well, in South Africa, um, these are the current formal mentoring programs that are available. Bridge the Gap is uniquely to its university. My understanding, Craig, um, and I guess you can comment later on, is that the Geological Society is talking about rolling out a mentoring program as well, uh, probably next year. And then if you're overseas or international programs that you can use, um, and I know it's acronym soup, so I'll go through it. Um, so United States Geological Survey does one, obviously American based. Women in Mining in the UK does one. Um, Earth Sciences Women's Network, which is an American organization, they do a very structured and well-developed program in the States. Um, Prospectus Developers and Association in Canada they do one through PDAC, uh, British Geological Survey does one, and young mining professionals also have a structured mentoring environment. I've, led, I've mentored at the YMP in London uh, last year. And if you really want to get formal, this is the type of thing you can, you can find on the internet. So this is an example from the Earth Science Women's Network, where you can see how they're now actively teaching you or guiding you to then select different people in different mentorship roles. So people that are colleagues, um, people that can provide emotional support if you need it, people that will be able to provide you with the intellectual challenges that you need, people that you feel are safe to go to and talk about whatever is on your heart without it being shared with other people and people that are going to help get you career opportunities as well. Um, this one is freely available to download if you go to the Earth Science Women's Network webpage. But after all that, so hopefully by being in this mentorship relationship, you have helped the young professional, and now speaking from a mentor's point of view, create um, competency, and they're now someone that you can start letting loose. But really what's the end goal? Well, partially it's being a mentor, but being a mentor is also being in a leadership role. Uh, 
I really wish I could have had the idea to do this. I didn't. Um, again, the references are all at the bottom. But how did Darth Vader get to the top and his career guide to success? Um, so if you go to reach Wikipedia, this is a summary of um, the article that they've gotten, Darth Vader's Guide to Leadership. But again, we can see the training that he's on the, undergone, learning from the best people in the business, being able to influence, having a large and extensive knowledge base and understanding exactly how to implement that knowledge to get the correct results. As a leader being fair, but also being able to contribute to the team. Praising those people that are performing the jobs correctly, but using the, the correct level of censure and punishment for underperforming people. Um, Jack Welsh, if you ever read from the gut um, for General Electric, he implemented what he called the bottom 10% rule. So every quarter, the bottom 10% of the staff would get fired until he got to the level where all staff members, even including the worst staff member, is probably a top performer in any other environment and organization. But what he also was doing, and this is something that Jack Welsh did, and uh, I'm not comparing Jack Welsh to Darth Vader, but it's a constant monitoring and evaluation of performance to ensure that all staff members and team members are performing at the top level where they can be, but also taking the necessary um, measurements to improve teamwork. And again, teamwork is critical. One of the things that also doesn't always come across in the mentoring environment is that you're being mentored as, as an individual, but that information imparted should be for the betterment of the team because each person as an individual mentors don't have everything. You as the mentee are not going to be able to be 100% successful in all areas. You're going to have to depend on other people and it's the way you interact with them and get them to help you is going to make success or failure of your career. But also as a leader, and as a mentee, having the vision, where do you want to get to? Is there someone that's going to help you achieve those goals? Do you know your priorities and can you communicate? So again, just slightly moving to the side, instead of the focus always being on technical skills, a lot of the times mentors should also assist in the, the mentee in how to communicate appropriately and correctly in the environment or the culture that they're working in. Okay, and again, getting back to assessing, helping, and establishing to create the, power, the most powerful team he possibly could. But no leader is an island. So again, taking the downtime. So even from a mentor mentee point of view, there is those times where you need to take a break, reflect on the information that's been gathered, reflect on those learnings and knowledge, and then come back again to start afresh. Um, being a hard worker. So as you can see here, the conclusion is that he was a really great leader, but maybe his outcomes of building Death Stars and blowing up planets were not the best application of those skills that he, that he had. So in conclusion, remember this journey is all about you and where you want to go to. So if there's any questions, here we go. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, I'll open the floor to questions and comments now. I'll start with one myself. Uh, you mentioned the uh, GSSA mentorship program. This is just kicking off. It's actually a SACNAS program and it's experimental at this stage. It's, it's being championed by Tanya Marshall, the Vice President of, of uh, Professional Affairs in the GSSA. And we're just rolling that out now uh, with a limited number of mentees and mentors to start with and we'll see how it goes. The other comment I'd like to make, um, followed by a question, is um, it's always been my belief that one of the deliverables that a mentor can give to a mentee or a protege is, is introduction to networks, to professional networks. For a, a technical or, or managerial leadership, and um, I'm, I'm wondering if you agree with that, firstly. And secondly, 
How are we going to handle networking and in fact the mentor mentee relationship in a post COVID world? Do you have any suggestions or comments on that? Okay, well, the first one I actually did comment on is in some of the bullet points. Um, you know, introducing you to the mentee, to technical people and people that will help develop the career. Uh, the post COVID world, that will be a lot more interesting. I have tried to do remote mentoring in the past. Um, I don't think it's been particularly successful all the time. Given that also, given that I have been sitting in the UK and the mentees have been sitting in South Africa, so there has been a, a time zone, time zone difference. Um, and generally, I've I've also found that you know, face to face over a cup of coffee or even a cold beer generally results in a more relaxed environment. Uh, I. I personally, I find that doing things remotely through Zoom or Skype, there's always a certain formal distancing, all puns intended, which occurs, even if it's not necessarily true. Um, so uh, I guess to sort of not answer the question, I'm not too sure myself. I think we're going to have to try and there may have to be other ways of approaching the traditional mentoring and relationship. Any other comments or questions from our participants in this meeting. I, I've got a question. Yes, go ahead. Um, how do you find the age difference between mentors and mentees? If the mentor is maybe younger than the mentee, do you see that as an issue? Sorry, who am I talking to? Oh, uh, it's Jan from Reflex in South Africa. Uh, hi, Jan. Um, I had never had that issue, Jan. Um, it depends, I guess it depends on the individual's concern. Um, I've had a number of people I consider as mentors who have been much younger than me because they have specific technical skills. So it's more of a case of, you know, burying the ego and working in that relationship. Cool, thanks. Keen, McCallum, you have your hand up. Hi guys. I just want to say, Mark, uh, uh, certainly I haven't had much of that problem with uh, the mentor-mentee age relationship. I think I'm too old for that now. But I just, <laughs> I just have uh, uh, maybe some comments to make. I think, you know, thanks, thanks for, for a great talk. I think, you know, that, that's, that slide you showed from, from the women's, uh, um, it's about three slides ago, from, from the women's mentorship program. I think that, you know, for me, that one, yeah. That top one, sponsorship, you know, is an absolutely critical part of, 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 of this mentoring issue because quite often what happens is there's massive budgetary constraint, there's time constraint, there's not enough people on the team, people have to go to study at WITS and you know, there's all sorts of things going on and as soon as you lose um, that sponsorship uh, individual, you know, the, 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 the guy or the, or the girl who's helping you to make the time, get the money, get the time off, um, time to do tasks and projects. You know, that, it, it, it's a difficult thing, and I, I've, you know, I've spent a lot of my time, you know, sponsoring people and making sure that PhDs get done and MSCs get done. Those of you who know me from bits will know that well. But, but, but it's it's an ongoing battle. And as a mentor, or you know, whether it's a coach or a mentor or a, you know, whatever it is, I think you know that's a critical role that that we have to realize as businesses, not necessarily just as people, and we have to play those roles um, to make sure that we offer the people the opportunity to do the things the right way. Um, and then, and then, you know, th that whole comment on on formal sponsorship versus the, the 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 more casual relationship. Quite often, I've found working relationships are very, very rarely found myself mentoring once I've left a site, you know, like, a, you know, Le Moana or, or a Hummingbird or Barry, you know, wherever. I have found myself not, uh, you know, the, those mentorship uh, relationships break down too quickly. Mm -hmm. So I found they work very, very well in a, uh, you know, in a, you know, on the job kind of environment. I don't know if anyone else has a, has a comment on that. Um, Mr. Matlaji had his hand up. Well, okay, um, that's Miss actually. Miss, <laughs> sorry. Yes. <laughs> um, hi. Thank you for um for allowing me to ask the question. Thank you, uh, Mr. Bennett, for the great presentation. So my question is, so as a master student who is about to 
complete um, her M and hoping to get into the working industry next year. I had the privilege of um, attending a WIMSA event um, just last week, Wednesday. And so I met a couple of, you know, the, the women there and some of them, you know, with like uh, geology or mining backgrounds and others not, um, they are in entrepreneurship and in WIMSA. And so my question was just like, my question is how do I approach them for mentorship? I think for me, it's always been a question of like, you know, what's the right way of actually asking for mentorship from people that you've already identified? Nolene, are you still on the line? Could you respond to that? I I'm am on sure the line. Oh, I okay. am. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Um, that, that's a very good question. And I think pretty much just ask them. If you've identified somebody that you think would be a good mentor, ask. Um, they can only say no, but chances are they'll say yes. Um, with WIMSA, as you know, they have a very uh, structured mentorship program. And on their website, you will be able to find who's in charge of mentoring. Uh, just get hold of them. Alternatively, you can email me. Um, Nolene Pauls. That's it. Okay, can I find you on LinkedIn and we can con um, continue the conversation there? You can, absolutely. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? No. I think actually... Yeah, go I'm ahead. sorry. I, I think I actually have a follow-up question. So also with mentorship, because a lot of the times it's said that like, you know, early career, I've always wondered about this question, especially like when I was getting into my honors year, like when should, uh, when should a student start seek seeking mentorship? Like I think, you know, especially with, you know, like from third year and onwards, like in your postgraduate level, you know, is that, some, is, this, is that a place where you should be seeking mentorship or only when you get into a job, exactly? Uh, Mark, what's your view on that? My take as early as possible. Um, mm. If you wanted a career in geology, if, and again, it's not always possible because you're starting from school, you just don't have that network. But if mm. you, or put it this way, probably some of the most successful mining professionals I've seen have been people that knew already knew someone in the business. So the dad was a chief geologist or the father was a, a section manager. So they already had a certain degree of network that they could just step into. So the, and also every time you want to make a career step change. So, you know, when you're in third year going to honors, for example, or rather probably more appropriately is when you're in honors, and you want to choose that MSc topic. I mean, the, obviously, is the, there's always the tension between what projects are available and sponsoring is available versus, um, you know, where do you want to go to? And now, if you could have someone that could help guide you and say, look, you know, and this is not knocking, you know, someone doing isotope analysis on, you know, uh, wormhole burrows. But the point is, it may not be the most appropriate master's degree to go to or to take up if you want to go into banking and finance. You know, mm -hmm. so they, they may be able to sort of guide you in, in, in the correct manner. So, you know, so yes, as early as possible. Okay. In terms of potentially asking a question you haven't answered is, well, when should you start mentoring someone? Um, and again, mm -hmm. as early as possible, I mean, you, okay, in your specific case, you've done a master's degree and now wanting to get into industry. So hopefully, or you're looking for someone that's going to be an in industry that can help guide you. But there's going to be all those third year students and honor students that are now sitting in the same predicament you've just been through. And it's like, well, what do I do? And because you're the same age, the same cultural background, it just helps because you can say, look, I've done this. It didn't work. Maybe we should, maybe you should try doing that. So, you know, mentoring from that point of view doesn't necessarily have to be 30 years experience in the industry and gray hair and, you know, everything else. You, you can start helping, you know, as, as soon as you've got to the next level above, you can help the person below you. Mm, I definitely agree. One Thank of you. the things that I, I, I tell students in particular when I stand in front of them is that networking, which I consider to be part of the mentoring process, 
is really extremely important. Uh, networking is, is uh, critical. And I tell people, um, in my experience, 90% of, of jobs that are, or, or hires that are made are never advertised. They're based on networks and personal relationships. And so it's important to um, carry those through throughout your career. Mm. Are Thank there any other much, questions Chris. or comments or queries? Keen, you've got your hand up again. Sorry, I sound like a broken record. Um, I just want to you know, come back. Uh, you know, you touched on it, on it now, Craig, as well as, uh, as, as Rob. You know, that whole mentoring is a two-way street. And, and, and the way we're kind of like approaching it here is, is it's very one, one directional. And I think that as a, as a, as a corporate member or as a, as a GSSA member or as a SACNASP or whichever, you know, whichever one you want to choose, I think, I think we're failing the students. Um, because we're, we're, you know, guys like yourself, Craig and, and, and Rob, you obviously are, uh, are in a different environment to the guys who live out on the ops and, uh, you know, in, in jungle somewhere in, in the middle of Africa. But still, there's an opportunity for, for bi-directional bi communication and for us to be, as, as professionals, to be more involved. And I think we, we're, we're letting the team down a bit in general, and, and I look at myself too in particular. Yeah, I, I agree with that, and and things are. It's going to be even more difficult going forward in a, in a post-pandemic world. Exactly. Uh, we're just. I think a lot of us are talking about new skill sets that are going to be required, and it's um, hard to mentor someone when you yourself haven't been involved in in some of these specialist IT operations that are going to be required going forward. Yeah. So the men, the mentees, the proteges have to be aware of that too. The mentors are going to have shortcomings. Yeah, yeah. I remember, you know, I, I look back in my you know, tainted career, and and uh, uh, you know, back in the in the early nineties, it wasn't unusual to be seconded to head office for two years, you know. Um, but somehow that doesn't happen anymore. You know, it all has to happen out there, and uh, and I think we're we're missing a trick somewhere. Yeah. Any other comments or queries before I close the meeting? Craig, just from me, um, Keen, I'll, are you keen to join our mentorship program <laughs> in that case? I will sign you up for that. Thank you. I'm very, um, very available. No problem. <laughs> okay. No, no. Oh, Safiso. Ah, oh, Safiso. Yeah. You're so good at this, eh? <laughs> of course. Um, so ju just to, to, to add before you close, Craig, um, I'd just like to thank Joe Explosto. Uh, they are our annual sponsor and our sponsor for the, Ju for the June um, two, uh, lockdown lectures. Uh, that's correct, Nolene? That's correct, Safiso. All right. So we'd just like to say thank you. And thanks again to Mark. Uh, apologies, I couldn't get on 15 minutes before the call, Mark. If you can just stay on the line and Craig as well, once everyone else leaves, please. Okay. Well, before you go, my next talk, I'm doing a self-advertising. It's not easy going green and I have Kermit the Frog participating. So I will see you all there in the 19th. <laughs> we'll be there, right. Mark. <laughs> just, just to repeat, okay. that's on the 19th. Uh, in terms of upcoming ones, uh, Okay, that is the next one, it seems. Um, Nolene can update on that. Thank you. I'm sorry, I can't. I'm not sitting at my computer. Um, but okay, look out for the calendar, got, guys. Yeah, everybody's got the calendar link. Um, if you don't, please go to our website, and the calendar contains all our upcoming talks. With that, uh, thank you very much, Mark. Uh, we can close the meeting. I'll keep the meeting open if everybody could just leave. And I guess uh, Safiso and I and Mark will stay on. Yeah, uh, you can stop the recording. Thanks, Craig. Okay, thank you. Oh, that sounds on, uh, not anonymous, Safiso.